RTD says it can find a new leader to turn around its troubles for the low, low price of $400,000. Denver's decision to close halfway houses has rippled into the suburbs. Aurora does the Colfax Marathon a favor and then gets stiffed by that run down the wickedest street in America. Marshall is racing to get answers because I only run when I'm chased. That's next. Republicans in Washington tonight are scrambling to deal with a split in their party over whether to extend President Trump's impeachment trial with witnesses. And it appears like Colorado's Republican Senator, Senator Cory Gardner is a key player in that debate. Now, we have dinged him here on this program for avoiding our impeachment questions. But boy, his campaign gave us a clear answer tonight. The Wall Street Journal just reported that Gardner, in a closed door session, warned his fellow Republicans not to allow witnesses that could prolong the trial and hurt his reelection. Gardner's campaign pushed back hard on the record, saying that what the senator said was that Democrats want a longer trial in order to hurt Republicans, and that's why he is against prolonging things. After many weeks of inquiries, now we know where Senator Gardner stands on witnesses. If we are sitting here a decade from now talking about how RTD is America's best transit agency, don't laugh, we might say that the turnaround began tonight. RTD's picking a temporary leader and it's building a mountain of money to go search for somebody to permanently fix the agency's persistent issues. Our Steve Stager is hanging out at RTD's house tonight. Uh, Steve, is this a good sign or a bad sign that they think it might take $400,000 just to find their new boss? Well, I suppose if you go by the whole you get what you paid for thing, then it might be actually a good idea. So I asked RTD, what do you get when you're talking about $400,000, they say this would include hiring an executive search firm, communications outreach associated with the search, and external legal counsel to conduct negotiations for both the interim CEO and whoever this new CEO is. And all of this conversation going on while the RTD board is meeting tonight to talk about who that interim leader might be. Gathered over a late lunch, the RTD board is making its decision tonight, who to offer the temporary job to leading this agency. Picking a temporary leader and approving a budget for the search for a permanent leader are the only two items on the agenda for this special session. At this time, I will entertain a motion to proceed into executive session. While they close the door, let's talk about that second item. The proposal is for the board to pull $400,000 from its reserves to start this national search for a new GM. A decent amount of money. How does that compare to other national searches for leaders in our area? In 2011, the city of Denver spent $45,000 interviewing external candidates for police chief. They landed on Robert White, and when White retired, the city tells us they didn't spend an extra dime in the search for Paul Pazin since they only interviewed internal candidates. Over at CDOT, the process was a little different. Director Shoshana Liu was selected by Governor Jared Polis's transition team. The spokesman said the best answer he could get as far as cost there 1500 bucks for her flight and hotel for her interview. The most expensive local search we found was for DPS superintendent, $215,000 to select an internal candidate, Susana Cordova. A breakdown of those expenses sent to us today included 103,000 for community engagement, 37,000 for a recruiter, and more than $26,000 for printing. Some numbers we chewed on while sitting outside a closed door. So we asked RTD, how much did this cost last time in 2015 when they were looking for a GM at that point? They couldn't get us an answer before broadcast. So we talked to one of the board members, Natalie Menton, who is a fiscal hawk. She says she's tracked the checkbook. She added up about $109,000 in costs when they picked Dave Genova to run this, or the, run this agency back then. By the way, out of this $400,000, the agency tells me they'll return what they don't use back into reserves, but they have really no estimate on exactly how much this search might cost. They are in executive session right now. They met at 3.30. They've been in executive session ever since. We'll get you that name out of those five candidates whenever we get it, Kyle. All right. All right. Well, we're going to get a hard, a hard name tonight. I don't know, Steve. I have to think. Hey, 
when I leave, they're going to do a nationwide search just to pick you in the end. I mean, obviously. So I hope that Nine News doesn't spend four hundred thousand dollars just just to to pick Steve Stager. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, like it'd be cool if they did. But yeah, <laughs> I agree. It'd be cool. If <laughs> I mean, they did. Sure, I I wouldn't turn it down. Sure, but sure. All right, I think probably save yeah. money. I'm just saying. All right, thank you, Steve. <laughs> Say, we told you how some state legislators are fed up with RTD's issues and want to step in with some new governance and transparency. Well, tonight RTD released its official response to the bill point by point. There are nine concerns and two points of agreement. So we'll put them down as a no. All right, so I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. When Denver City Council very prominently cut ties with private prison companies that were running halfway houses, they didn't like them. Some of the people who were living in those facilities just moved to another halfway house run by the same private prison company in Arapahoe County. Well, now Arapahoe is telling Denver the inn is full. Prepare to find another facility to solve the problem that you created. Arapahoe County says the population at its women's residential center has spiked since Denver City Council's quick decision. So Arapahoe is instituting a population cap. When they reach that number, Arapahoe will start refusing referrals from Denver. Denver's scrambling to set up a city-run halfway house for women. Denver's community corrections folks tell me they've been trying to place clients in Jefferson County first to avoid the whole private prison company in Arapahoe County. They acknowledge outside of those two, there really aren't other options for women in community corrections in the metro area. Denver hopes to have its city-run program up by this fall. So think back. 15 years and imagine video technology. All right, 15 years ago, we were watching VHS tapes. Now, everything's streaming, everything's online. Here's a warning though. This next story is about the worst way that such technology can be used to exploit kids. And our state's laws about that are living in the age of the VHS tape. Here's Anusha Roy. There will be certain images that we've come across in this work that will never leave my mind. You know, it's a curse in the sense of that, that it will never leave me, but it is also a motivating factor of why it's important that day in and day out we strive to do better. As many as 40 child porn cases come through the Laramar County District Attorney's Office every year, and most of them end up in front of Brian Hardway. That child has to know it will never go away. He has been doing his best to prosecute those responsible, but the law hasn't always been on his side. It hasn't been really updated uh, in five, 15 years. And that was just to update the language to show that movies no longer are only on VHS tapes. The law is so antiquated, it's worth repeating that the last time Colorado's law regarding child porn was updated is when people were still using VHS tapes. Fast forward to 2020, where streaming videos, using webcams, and sharing links are becoming more common. And that means proving possession is a lot more challenging, forcing some prosecutors to make deals they don't want to. As we were concerned about if we went to a jury and tried to prove it under the current possession statute, that the jury could walk. It makes me sick, to be honest, to think about how many child porn cases are slipping through the cracks because the advancements in technology and the lack of laws to prosecute. Them. So when district attorneys around the state started telling lawmakers about this issue, Democratic Representative Dylan Roberts said they proposed a new state law to keep up with today's technology, including cloud-based data and live streaming. I absolutely think the law has fallen behind the times. I mean, technology moves so quickly and we only meet for 120 days a year, so we're going to be behind on any advancement in technology, but the, the gaps that we have here are really uh, concerning. There are also some concerns that expanding a law like this could mean that innocent people could get in trouble. Hardwin says that could include juveniles who may be consensually sending images to each other, but both him and Representative Robert said that that shouldn't be the case. But they said the key right now is just to make sure that this law is written very clearly mm -hmm. and has a narrow focus. And so it's going to be up for debate again next Tuesday, so in about a week. Anything that comes through the legislature that's going to cost a dime has mm -hmm. to have like a price tag attached to it and yeah. how they're going to come up with the money. This will have a cost. Yes. Yeah, so what they're saying is that they don't have a cost yet, but what they want to do is increase a surcharge. So basically anyone who is convicted of a crime like this mm -hmm. would have to pay a, a higher fine to the state. And then they want to use that money and put it towards software to investigate these cases, basically towards resources that the state doesn't have yet. And so the question would be, does that allow the state to be able to keep up with the number of cases? Cases they're dealing with now. All right.
Thank you, Nusha. May I make a recommendation? This is where we point you towards something that did not come from us at 9 News or Next, but I think is worth your time. A lot of words have been written and spoken about Kobe Bryant since his death over the weekend. You have to hear ESPN's L. Duncan's tribute, which got the hashtag girl dad trending today. Her ode to Kobe Bryant's unabashed love of being a dad to girls, and a dad only to girls, in this culture where men are often expected to want and need a son, that tribute is beautiful. It busted me up for obvious reasons. I bet a lot of you have already seen it. If you haven't, or you'd like to share it, you can find it on the next Facebook page. A CU graduate lost his life in one of America's most public tragedies. 34 years later, his love for his alma mater lives on. Aurora erased the debt owed by the Colfax Marathon. Then the marathon erased Aurora from its route. And a sad sign, we haven't seen snow in a while. That's next. Americans gathered 34 years ago today to witness history and instead saw horror as the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded above Kennedy Space Center. One of the seven astronauts lost that day was a CU grad. Colonel Ellison Anzuka's love for the buffs lives on. Byron Reed has that story. The Heritage Center is a museum that tells the history of the campus. Sometimes it takes seeing things with your own two eyes. We have Glenn Miller's gallery. We have his original gold record and his see you trombone that he hawked for a bus ticket to Hollywood. To understand the importance of the past. I think it's really important that you can get a first-hand look at some of the objects that go along with the stories that we tell. Allison Smith is the director of the Heritage Center on the campus of CU Boulder and says the center is a point of pride for the university. We get 49,000 people a year through here, and so we're very happy to share the story of CU with them. We're in the Space Exploration Gallery. We have 20 astronauts associated with CU. Stories of alumni like Ellison Onizuka, who lost his life in the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion 34 years ago today. Ellison had taken with him, as several astronauts do, some personal objects that he wanted to fly up and then bring back. Two of those were a CU football that's marked 
and also SCU engineering flag. Smith says the items were recovered intact by NASA and returned to his widow, Lorna. And then Lorna donated them to the Heritage Center. Smith says she's happy to share the pride of the university. And we have the campus laid out in Legos. And the alumni from CU who made history come to life. For next, I'm Byron Reed. Beautiful sunshine this Tuesday as we remain in between storm systems with another one on the way and another chance for snow before you might be ready. It's dry out there tonight. Travel just fine. I-25 and I-70. Temperatures in the 40s this afternoon, but it felt a little cooler than that. We've got high pressure which kind of built in quickly behind yesterday's storm and now it's shifting east in response to this next system already moving our way from the northwest and you can see the high and mid-level clouds coming in. This is the mountain snow producer tomorrow and it may bring a little bit of light snow to Denver. There are no advisories for travel across our state. We have a dry night tonight, a mostly cloudy and colder day tomorrow with snow showers in the mountains in the two to six inch range and a 30% chance of showers in the form of snow primarily across our forecast area. Not tonight, cool, calm and dry lows in the mid 20s. Tomorrow, not as nice as today. Temperatures similar, but a good chance of snow for many of you in the foothills and suburbs above 7,000 feet. Nice warming trend heading into the weekend. Some models suggest 70 as we move into the first few days of February and then another storm and another chance for snow. It's a sign that our dry January has had a sobering effect on snowmen. Mary Ellen sends a photo of a snowman in her neighborhood, apparently trying to hitchhike from Roxborough Park to the North Pole. Now, this was on Saturday when the Denver metro area had gone nearly a month without any measurable snow. So that was either pretty large to begin with or pretty hardy. But nobody picks up hitchhikers anymore. Uh, and by Monday, he was looking pretty rough. Roxborough Park did finally get some moisture during the day, but it was rain and rain is not kind to snowmen. Note the updated sign from Mary Ellen's neighbors. Snowman for sale, cheap assembly required. If you see something and say that's a sign, even if it's not really a sign, share, will you? Email next at 9news.com or give me a shout with the hashtag HeyNext. Aurora did the Colfax Marathon a favor and then the marathon cut Aurora out of its route. City's like, nah. And look again, that's not one of those Red Bull promotional vehicles. It's not how you Colorado. Next.
If somebody owes you money and you forgive the debt, you probably at least expect to thank you in return, right? The city of Aurora forgave a $65,000 debt owed by the Colfax Marathon, and the race thanked them by leaving Aurora. Our resident runner, Marshall Zellinger, raced off in search of answers, and he is fast. Denver's Colfax Marathon and Half Marathon have had a funny name. The races aren't run entirely in Denver, and many of the miles are not run on Colfax. The marathon goes to Lakewood, the Half Marathon goes to Aurora. At least it did until the race changed course today. We don't want to change too much, but we do want to give some relief to that neighborhood. Race director Cree Kelly announced the course change in an email this morning. The half marathon no longer enters Aurora. Any of the minor complaints that I might have gotten over the years, whether it was in Denver or Aurora, are usually aff are affecting a neighborhood person. And I don't want to keep doing that. But here's the thing that caught my eye. I remember an Aurora City Council agenda from a year and a half ago where the city erased $65,000 that Colfax still owed from when the city gave money to help start the race 15 years ago. In exchange for not paying back the $65,000, the city was offered 25 years worth of race entries valued at more than $65,000. Booth space at the race expo and after party, marketing of Aurora's choosing, the city logo on race materials, and it would allow the marathon to continue funding charity awards. I wasn't very happy about simply ignoring or, or zeroing out the loan, so instead I asked if we could do a sponsorship. Councilman Dave Gruber helped negotiate the agreement in 2018. I have to admit I was so surprised at the generosity of the package. I thought it was a, you know, pick five uh, as opposed to the entire group, so I thought it was a very generous package. I would have made that same agreement because I understand that the, there is simply not money there. It would have been silly to enforce uh, payment of a loan when I know the organization couldn't pay us back. By not having to pay the city, race organizers can continue to fund prize money for relay teams to win and donate to charity. The Aurora firefighters, they happen to be super fast runners. So if you look over the last number of years, they've actually won $20,000 for the Firefighters of Aurora Benevolent Fund. So you can't just look at what a small arrangement is. We look at the bigger picture. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. No gratuitous shots of Marshall in the tiny little shorts. I don't know. Missed opportunity. I am endlessly amused by people who try to move large, awkward items with their small cars. Unless I'm behind them on the road. Nobody likes that. But hey, you're not driving, so you will enjoy this and your feedback next.
Ah, uh, yes, another great reminder. That's not how you Colorado. This specifically is not how you move a hot water heater in Colorado or anywhere else, honestly. This is fantastic. It, it's strapped on the back of that little Honda Civic, totally blocking the back window. This image first showed up on Reddit. We tracked down the person who took the picture at 3rd and Santa Fe. First glance, I was thinking that was one of those, you know, Red Bull promotional cars with the big can on the back. Come on, you saw that too. I know you did. Jen wrote in this week to say on Saturday, my dad suffered a spinal cord injury requiring surgery. Even in tough times, you can find something to laugh at. While checking his arterial line, the doctor said, a line still working. My medicated dad chimed in, let Kyle know. See you next time.